Ambassador Chess Freeman, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense, also former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia. It's great to have you with us, sir, today. It's a privilege. Right, so Operation Pillar of Cloud that Israel has carried out in Gaza is over now. Both Israel and Hamas are claiming victory. Who do you think is the winner? I don't think Israel is the winner, uh, except in one sense, and that is it demonstrated that the Iron Dome missile defense system will work. Otherwise, in the arena of public opinion internationally in the region, it lost heavily. Uh, nobody likes to see uh, advanced military aircraft bombing civilian populations, which is what was happening. Um, and, of course, this energized Egypt diplomatically in a new way, and it generated a lot of support for the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, despite the fact that uh, many of the governments that came to visit uh, sent their foreign ministers to, to Gaza, for example, don't like Hamas at all. In fact, they fear it. Uh, so it clearly strengthened the uh, uh, Hamas both in the Palestinian territories and in the Arab world uh, politically. And I think that's a victory for Hamas and a defeat for Israel. But Israel invokes the right to defend itself against terrorism, and this is a claim backed by countries such as the United States and Germany. You certainly don't deny Israel this right, do you? Certainly not. And um, but. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can take preemptive attack uh, action uh, to attack others, especially civilians. The fact that one side commits occasional acts of terrorism does not justify state terrorism. And in this case, there was no rocket fire of any consequence from the uh, Gaza Strip into Israel prior to Israel's inauguration of a military raid that killed uh, the military uh, leader of uh, Hamas. Hamas is an organization that doesn't have much of a military capacity. Um, many people actually say that Israel, back in 2008, 2009, um, and also this time, if it really wanted to, could have squeezed Hamas out of Palestine, but it didn't do so. Why? Well, I think Israel did attempt very in, to use uh, violence um, in the earlier cast lead operation. It did, that was at the uh, very end of 2008, uh, as uh, there was a change of administrations going on in Washington. It's interesting, this war also happened well, around the U.S. election time. Exactly. But, do you think but Israel failed. Um, and uh, the reason it failed is that the strategy is wrong. Uh, you cannot bomb people into peaceful coexistence. It just does not work. You just spoke about the elections. It was right after the presidential election in right. the United States and right before the elections in Israel. Um, what does it suggest to you? Is the timing important or was it a coincidence? Well, I suspect that the timing in this case was dictated by the Israeli election. Uh, it's very popular in Israel to kill lots of Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, and Hamas is seen as a monster. And so uh, a war against Hamas wins votes. You know, I want to talk about um, the wording of the Operation Pillar of Cloud, obviously referring to the Bible, and back in the Bible, um, it was the Pillar of Cloud who led the Israelis through e out of Egypt and saved them from the Pharaoh. How much does the Torah narrative actually dominate the mindset of Israeli war planners? Well, the religious element uh, in both in the Israeli armed forces, uh, largely settler-driven, um, not Orthodox Jews, many of whom don't want to serve in the military, refuse to do so. But the religious complexion of the Israeli Defense Forces is, is uh, steadily increased. Uh, so uh, religion is now very much bound up with uh, its operations. Uh, the language of some rabbis during cast lead was uh, simply hair-raising in terms of evoking Old Testament images of genocide against uh, non-Jews. Um, I think also it's true that uh, this use of language reflects the fact that the Israeli-Palestinian struggle, which began as a sort of struggle between two competing nationalisms, mm -hmm. and became a struggle between Arabs and Israelis, has now become a struggle between Jews and Muslims. In the Western media, though, the Operation Pillar of Cloud was renamed Pillar of Defense. Oh, I suppose it sounds less alarming. Um, defense. Uh, is a good thing, isn't it? Um, attacking people behind a cloud perhaps maybe isn't. Uh, evoking memories of Old Testament violence raises questions. 
uh, perhaps in the broader world. Um, so this is a sort of typical uh, example of what the Israelis call Hasbara, which is control of narrative uh, and propaganda. And um, they do it very well. In 2009, you were nominated to lead the National Intelligence Council in President Obama's administration, and you declined um, due to pressure of what you've called the Israeli lobby in the United States. You precise later on that it's actually more correct to call it the Likud lobby or the lobby of the right wing in Israel. What exactly do you mean by that definition? Well, I think um, if you look at the American Jewish community, which from which the activists in the Israel lobby are drawn, there is a large passive support for Israel among Christian fundamentalists, but they are not active, generally speaking. The activists come from a very limited segment, about 4% of the American Jewish community. And these are people who are strong supporters of the extreme right wing in Israel. There's another very interesting instance that you describe. I'm going to read out a quote of yours. Um, you were being told by a senior Israeli official, thank you for what you did for Israel. What job in President Bush's administration do you want? How exactly does that work? I mean, can a foreign power actually influence staffing of national security positions in the U.S. government? Well, when this man, who I had considered a friend and rather admired, tactlessly made that offer to me, uh, I thought he could deliver it. I thought he was making a real offer, and I was enraged. Uh, as somebody, as an American patriot, I don't like the idea that any foreign country, even one close to us, uh, should be able to dictate our decisions about our internal politics. Was it a bluff, or could he really deliver it? I think it? he might have been able to deliver it. I didn't take him up on it for obvious reasons. I thought it was a despicable But that's kind offer. of scary. It is a little scary, yes. Um, but you see, um, there is, a nar again, a narrative, which is that Israeli interests and American interests are identical. Israeli values and American values are identical. Neither is true, if you examine it. Uh, Americans don't, by and large, support racism these days. Uh, Israelis do. Uh, Americans do not support segregation or apartheid. Israelis do. But then uh, Israeli narrative would be nothing without American backing. Yes, America is a wonderful echo chamber for Israel uh, because our relations are so intimate. Uh, we are um, so much in contact with each other, and the American media are so... Uh, amenable to spreading uh, the Israeli line, the narrative, um, and the American media are enormously inter in influential internationally, and so this takes what might be a rather small voice from Israel and magnifies it and spreads it everywhere, and Israel is, after all, a very small country that is surrounded by enemies, whether it made those enemies itself or whether it simply uh, they're simply there is beside the point. Israel is in a difficult position. It uses everything it can, uh, it can use to, to defend itself, and this is one of the means of defense, a very strong one. What exactly are the priorities of the lobby in the United States, and how much power do they actually wield over the U.S. media? Well, I think it's less the media than the Congress. Um, but ultimately, the media also depend upon advertising. And uh, Congress works. The fuel of our Congress, I'm sorry to say, is campaign contributions, which is another way of saying our politics is pretty corrupt. Uh, you can buy votes. Um, the fuel for our media is advertising, and advertising can be withheld or granted, depending on what you say. You know what I always wondered? How come the Arab lobby is not so powerful? I mean, the Arab sheikhs could probably finance pretty much anything they wanted. Ah, interesting question. First of all, I don't think there is an Arab lobby. I think it is a fiction of the Israel lobby's imagination or perhaps a sort of construct they have created because you needed to have an enemy. So why isn't there an Arab lobby? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. We have a significant Arab-American population which potentially could uh, produce a lobby, but it's divided as the Arabs themselves are. So there's no domestic base that could focus the energy of this voting bloc in one direction. 
And second, uh, turning to the Arab states, uh, yes, the, the Gulf Arabs have plenty of money, but they also have no understanding of the importance of institutions as opposed to people. Their own politics is very personalized. Their own societies don't, in many cases, rest on institutional foundations. Um, they don't have a habit of sustained effort on anything. They are more likely to do something short term. They like the sprint rather than the marathon that is required in this uh, arena. Um, and probably many of them consider it improper uh, to, in effect, buy votes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I happen to agree with them, uh, but um, uh, they are behind the times, unfortunately. Uh, everyone else is doing it. So you don't have the domestic uh, base and you don't have the foreign support. And I might say that the Gulf Arabs, like other Arabs, they don't like the Arab Americans who are not mainly from the Gulf. The Gulf Arabs don't emigrate. There are no Saudi Americans to speak of. There are no uh, Qatari Americans to speak of. There are no Emirati Americans to speak of. Well, they come to study in states and then go back they to They come and study and they maybe have a vacation home and they uh, enjoy the United States as a visitor, but they don't emigrate. Do you regret withdrawing in 2009 and not taking the position? In not Dubai? at all. No, I'm, I, I didn't want to go back into the government. I had given 30 years of my life to public service. I thought that was plenty. I was very reluctant to do that job. And when I was publicly attacked in the way I was, it became apparent that I couldn't do the job. So the decision to withdraw was simply a matter of logic. And I don't regret it at all. I have a good life a better life than I would if I were doing that. I so think. you wouldn't consider taking another position in the government in the future? No, no, I think uh, I'd let somebody younger have a chance. Um, but um, no, I can't think of any position I would really like um, to do at this stage, uh, in part because at the moment our government is pretty dysfunctional. It's not uh, making many sensible decisions, and it seems to find it very hard to do that. We can't even pass a budget. Uh, we can't even address our fiscal imbalance. Uh, we don't address uh, any of our fundamental questions of um, foreign policy. We continue to do more of the same. In this circumstance, the chance that one individual could make a real difference is not very great. Um, and I'm, I'm happy cultivating my garden. <laughs> Ambassador Freeman, thank you very much for this interview. My pleasure.